It wastes of it wastes those who indulge in sin. Don't trifle with sin. Sin is dangerous. Sin does not elevate anyone. It degrades everyone. Sin does not make you bigger. It makes you smaller. It does not bring you forward. It brings you backward. It does not add anything to you, but it subtracts everything from you. It is more dangerous than a venomous snake. It has one goal and one goal in mind. That is death. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And you better believe it. I say you better believe it. But the prodigal son is an example for those who have found themselves trifling with the things of the world. Even though we have found ourselves in the pig pen of sin, smelling with the perfume of sin, there is hope according to the prodigal son's story. There is hope, hope that our heavenly father loves us. And he is continually calling us back home. For the Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Help me now somebody. That whosoever believeth in him should not perish but what? And that love you could focus on. That love you could see on Calvary displayed for you and I. And the Bible says that Jesus has tasted death, tasted death for every single man and woman upon this earth. All what we got to do is respond to that invitation. God's loving hand is always willing to embrace every prodigal son and daughter that returns home. But there are steps to, to be taken in coming back home. First, we discovered to make a decision to come back home. You have to be prepared to say to yourself and make a commitment to God in the privacy of your home, in the privacy of your, 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 your closet, and say, Lord, I am accepting you as Lord and Savior and be willing to follow personally. Hello, somebody? No one can force anyone to give their heart over to Christ. No one should bribe anyone in accepting Christ as their Lord and Savior. It's a decision that they make for themselves. So we saw in the prodigal son, because of the, the nastiness of his situation he found himself in, the degrading situation that he found himself in, he said, no, I got to rise, arise, and go to my father. So we have to first arise. When we make one step towards Jesus, he makes a hundred steps towards us. All what you got to do, the Bible says, is to be willing and obedient. And you shall eat the good of the land. Just be willing. As we see in the prodigal son story. Christ says, he that comes unto me, I will in no wise cast out. No matter what you have done, where you have been, who you have been with. God can turn things around. And what we also recognize in the prodigal son story that there must be repentance of sin. That is turning away from the life and of sin and returning home. Repent. We also recognize that the individual must confess. Confess the guilt and don't make excuses for the past actions. You know, people just like blaming others. People just like blaming other people. You know, just blaming people. Like Adam and Eve, that's in our nature. But take responsibility for your past actions. Be specific and let your heavenly father know that you are wrong. And that you are sorry for your past sinful actions. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, hallelujah, he is faithful. Hello, I thought somebody would say praise the Lord, hallelujah. God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. That is why, ladies and gentlemen, forgiveness is so important for the Christian. Yeah. If you want it, if you want to receive it from God, we are to give it to others. Confess and he forgives us of our sins. We also discovered that 
in, in Proverbs that therefore, uh, let me see this, let me see this. Let, the Bible says that he that confesseth and forsaketh, he has mercy. All right? The Bible also says that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So when you have given your heart over to Christ, you don't care what people say. Hello? You keep your eyes on the cross of Christ. And you press forward. Don't look to your left and don't look to your right. Man is not your judge. Man is not your standard. I say, Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation. You walk in power. Walk in miracle because you are forgiven. I do not want to preach today. But this thing is getting into me. I will do the final one, which is the law of God. Of course, that will encapsulate it will take in also the Sabbath because we recognize the Sabbath is in the center and the middle of the commandments of God. And we do not have nine commandments. We have ten commandments. So whatever I say as far as relating to the law, I'm also saying relating to the Sabbath. Amen? The world is in moral decadence. This is the time of the most corruption an immoral behavior in world's history. Persons are bold-faced in the despicable behavior. People act like there are no laws that govern the behavior of mankind. What is right and what is wrong, individuals use their feelings to govern what is right and what is wrong. Some individuals use the experience and assumption of what is right and what is wrong. For the Bible says, For there is a way that seemeth right unto the man, but the end of it are the ways of death. And let me say something here. People sometimes develop their own concept of salvation. They're telling God how to save them. It's the word of the living God. Is the word that provides guidance. So whatever you're thinking and understand about salvation, you go to the word and make sure that it aligns with the word. Huh. For the Bible says, yes. Because we are created in the image of God and we owe our existence to him, we must submit to his will for our lives. Hello? That's one of the ways. He created us. We are not from a blob or a single cell somewhere back then, billion years ago. We are not descendants from apes. We were created by the hands of a living God. And this God has provided laws in which we should govern our lives. And therefore, we discover that the will of God is the law of God. For the psalmist says, I desire to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. Some misconceptions that we discovered about the law of God, some people say that it is not relevant. Some people say that it's hard or impossible to keep. Have you heard that before? They say that it was nailed to the cross, cross or it was abolished. But ladies and gentlemen, we discovered that the Ten Commandments were written with the finger of God on tables of stone, which indicates permanency of the law of the great Jehovah. Jesus says, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it or to make it plain, to show the hypocritical Jews and Pharisees What's the best way to keep God's holy law? One of the big bombshell texts that was quoted in the week is found from James 2, 8 to 12. And it will answer many of the questions that we have about the law. The Bible says, If ye fulfill the royal law, according to scriptures, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin, and are convinced of the law as transgressors. 
For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point is guilty of all. And I believe the preacher was very deliberate to say to some of the Adventists, it is not just keeping the Sabbath. Not just putting nice clothes as well as it is good and coming to worship God and his memorial of creation. That's important. But it is equally important that we don't lie, we don't steal, we don't bear false witness. Why well, say that already? What's the others? Take the limb of the Lord in vain, honor thy father and thy mother. Don't commit adultery. Do not covet. So ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, it's not just the Sabbath. If you break one, you break all. And that's what the word of the Lord says. For he that says, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou committeth adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So speak ye, and so do, as thou shalt be judged by the law of liberty. From this passage above, we discovered that there are two principles in the Ten Commandments. Love towards God, that's the first four, and love towards thy neighbor, the last six. The law of God requires full obedience. If we, if we falter in one, we falter in all and are considered as transgressors. Also that the judgment, at the judgment, we will be judged according to the law of liberty or the ten commandments of God. Amen? Also, the law of God is not burdensome. The law of God is not what, everybody? For the Bible says in, in 1 John 5 and verse 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous or they are not burdensome and those who love Jesus does it joyfully and willingly hello we also discovered that the ten commandments law existed by oral tradition before Mount Sinai they knew about the ten commandments because the bible says that the bible says that Abraham kept it and we have that in Genesis chapter 26 and verse 5, because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and my commandments, my statutes and my laws. So Abraham kept the commandments or the ten commandments of God. The children of Israel kept the Sabbath before the law was given at Mount Sinai as discovered in Exodus, Exodus chapter 16. The Bible says that sin is the transgression of the law of God. Hello? And if sin existed at the fall, then the law of God would have been transgressed or be in existence at the fall. Amen? You say, okay, what laws that was transgressed? I, I just did, there's a preacher I listened to and he could actually see from Adam's sin, where he broke all ten commandments. But I could only identify like four of them. Covetousness. He sees something that does not belong to him, and he wants it. That's the fruit. Hello? They stole the fruit. It did not belong to them. They went and they partook of it. All right? They lied. When God asked them, what did they do? <laughs> They start blaming other people, not taking responsibility, you know. They said, Adam said who? The woman. And the woman said who? Lie. Just take responsibility. And the other thing is that Adam had a God before his creator God. He put Eve. He listened to Eve. So you see... In the, at the fall, many commandments were broken because the Bible says sin is the transgression of God's law. All right. 
Now, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, the function of the law of God is to point out sin. As a mirror which points out the dirtiness or the, 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 the soilness of our face. And after the sinner would have turned and after he would have seen his, his folly or his dirtiness or his sinfulness, by looking into the law, he turns to Christ to gain salvation and to be washed in the blood of Jesus. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20 is that therefore by the deeds of the law, shall no flesh be justified in the sight of God. But by the law, it is the knowledge of sin. Amen? And that, that, that fits very well. If there is no law, there is no sin. All right? And of course, the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and it is not of yourself. It is a gift of God. Not by works, lest any man should boast. And we also discovered love is the motivating element, the motivating attitude, the motivating disposition for an individual to be obedient to the commandment of God. Because Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. It's a conditional clause. If you don't love him, forget about it. But if you love him, keep the commandments of God. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who are here, we have a number of persons to give their heart over to Christ. I came a little late. We were doing the roundup and touching base with people. That is a very crucial time in the morning. And many things have happened this week because we are in a warfare. I don't know how many of you who were at that service, consecration service at Mango Hill? Once you work for the saving of soul, the enemy does not keep quiet. And I gave you all some examples that I have seen. And all of us ministers and, and evangelists who have worked for the saving of souls, we recognize, ladies and gentlemen, that it is a battle. Satan will not let go of none without a fight. And we had a rough time this week. But in the end, God prevails. I say God prevails because we have men and women here ready to say all the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask besides? And if you're here, you have not made up your mind yet. This is God's voice speaking to you. If you will hear his voice speaking to you today, harden not your heart. Harden not your heart. Please bow your heads with me as we pray. Holy God, burdens are lifted at Calvary. Father, your word has been very clear to us during the week. Satan is whispering nothing, nothingness in our ears. Trying to discourage us to turn our feet from the path of righteousness. And those that you have designated and that you have spoken to, we pray, O oh God, that they will not turn back that they will go all the way with you, dear God. We beg of you, dear Father, that as we press on today, that your Holy Spirit will continue to move in this place. Be with your manservant. Father, put words in his mouth. Father, may you electrify his brain cells. May you turpentine his imagination. Father, may you may you lubricate his tongue and dear father may you anoint him with the kerosene from heaven your Holy Spirit and set him ablaze so you could call your sons and your daughters before it is too late in the name of Jesus Christ we pray amen
all those who have come for baptism, we would like to see you downstairs. All of you who have signed the pledge card and prepared for baptism, we need to have a short meeting with you downstairs so we could fill in the necessary forms so we could be ready. So as soon as the preacher finishes, we could go quick order down to little B, little B, little B, to have a cemetery down there. All right, so all those who are scheduled to be baptism, to be baptized, I would like to see you downstairs now. Amen? We need to see you downstairs now. All right? That's one. Okay. Um, Glenford? Amen. Amen. We have that mansion. Yes. 
And to get to that mansion means to have that hope. Yes. So our hope is built on nothing less, nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Number 522, 522.
King, number 426. Savior bleed. I gave myself in thine. Number one six three.
went to the cross, we believe that he lives. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Five, two, six. And um, it's sad that she will be going, but she needs, she needs to go. We can't hold her back. So I'm saying, next Sabbath, which, which would be her last Sabbath, whatever the Lord put in your hand to bring, I'm leaving the basket on the table. So when you come next Sabbath, ladies and gentlemen, brethren, please bring whatever little bit the Lord put on your mind to bring to, for Sister Lila as a parting gift. We don't want no friendly conversation. Conversation can spend. So, whatever little bit you got, please to bring it. No bring too much to change because we don't have time to count that down kitchen, maybe. So, please to bring. You know, we don't have time to count that. Sister Henny, no bring no load to change up here. Please to bring one nice five dollar. Sister Henny, especially you. You love your change. So, next week, ladies and gentlemen, sister, we have really seen the wonderful job. Is, am, I telling, am I not telling the truth? Yes. Funeral, wedding, everything. Me have to tell the pastor sometimes, me have to charge you for child abuse. <laughs> you know, I'll find out the roof out in Corkill and join down Ash and your face away. This man will have to charge you for child abuse. Anyhow, I'm just saying to you, I, I mean, she didn't know I'm doing this. 
But please don't have a little basket with cover. Boy, it's such a small basket. Anyhow, next week when you come, I'm leaving it here for all week. So when you come next week, I'm bringing mine too. Please to bring whatever you offer in your heart to bring so we can give Sister Leila a nice sending off with. Thank you very much for listening. Have a nice day. happening now? I'm singing. I am singing now. Special. <laughs> if you're wondering, just tell me, just make me sing, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, and my heart is racing. It's a busy day. Take a deep breath. It's like sometimes people take deep breath and pass out, you know. <laughs> All right. Um, we are, we are publishing a band of marriage at this time. And there is more to come. And there is more to come. We are publishing the bands of marriage now. And we are saying they have more to come. We wish to publish the bands of marriage between Nehemiah Orlando Wilson, sorry, thank you very much, Sister Riley. We wish to publish the ban of marriage. I have to say the right name here. You all have to know who I'm speaking about. We wish to publish the ban of marriage between Nehemiah, Orlando Wisdom, Bachelor, Laborer of Hope Salem, and June and Natasha John, spinster, cashier of Salem. If anyone should show just, just cause, why these two should not be wedded, let them speak now or forever hold a peace. This is the first reading. And after the third one, and the following day, that will be the wedding. Amen. Amen. God bless you, and have a wonderful afternoon. Morning, morning. Okay, we are preparing the, the baptismal candidates. We are doing it different. I know the church don't, when it comes to change, they are resistant to change, but please bear with us. And give the pastors some leeway as we, you know, go through this process. They are being robed downstairs. Robed. I'll put on my robe too. And I will sit among them. After the sermon is being preached, we will do the vows and head straight to the waters. No delays. Because some of you have to eat. And no one eats until the candidates come back up here. Amen? Amen. Where are those in the kitchen? Those in the kitchen, they have a speaker downstairs. You all hearing me? Are you all hearing me? Yes. Amen. All right. Uh, we have one more item before the preacher preaches. That's a testimony. And um, it's a riveting testimony. I've heard it many times. And um, after this, the Lord will do his work. Amen? The Lord his do, his will do his work. Okay, God bless you. And I think you're coming up to do the offer. Oh, the offer tree. I put that done already. Sorry. Please come up and do the, the offer tree. Um, Reverend, there's a program, you know, it's just that things just happen and we have to deal with it. Amen? Worship, worship. Let's worship the Lord with our tithes, gifts, and offerings.
bow our heads for prayer. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of giving to your work. We thank you for providing for us, and we ask, dear Father, that you'll accept our offerings and our gifts. May you bless us, and may we continue to be a blessing to others, we pray in Jesus' name. Because he's smiling, you know. Yeah. If it's only him alone, I'm going to smile. Yeah. But the spirit, spirit, I could say brother now. Yeah. He wants to glorify God with his testimony. Yeah. And it's riveting. We will give him time to say everything probably next Sabbath afternoon. Because he has a lot. The Lord has been working in his life. And he's standing here because of God. Yeah. And he's prepared to give God the glory that is due to him. Thank you, Pastor. Good afternoon, church. Is morning? We don't reach 12 yet? Okay. All right. Good morning. As I, like my neighbor said, I'm so excited. We give thanks and we give praise to God for his glory, for his grace. Amen. Most of you, of course, know that you know me or you know of me. And most of you know that I could be as mischievous and as bad as I could be. Because all of us fall short of the glory of God. My journey may be longer than the prodigal son. So I'm going to try to see how I can chip through the, the, the important things as fast as possible. For those of us who think that we may look young, but we are old, we will admit. And so, Brother Philip, and so, 1969. Can I say that word, that, that number? 1969. I'm a member of the Catholic Church. I'm an acolyte. And you know that we had the greatest summer festivals in Montserrat. All of those, those of us who have made our advance know what we were part of that. And it would be a great festival in which we converted the church grounds to be Las Vegas. Amen? Yes. Las Vegas. We had liquor. We had gambling. We had, you name it, it would be there on that particular day. Early in the morning for the next day, and we can't talk like how the scriptures say we start at the dark and go to the next day. But when we are finished, as a young man, I've been told to help to hide the bottles for church next Sunday. What did I say? I had to hide the beer bottles so that they don't look so obvious for the Sunday. Well, I asked my mother and father, if we had the great fete in the presence of the, Pope, the bishop and the priest, why are we hiding for the bottles when the same person going to be preaching to us on Sunday. My mother said, a young boy like you can't take up this kind of situation. Leave it alone. If the bishop and the priest don't say it's wrong, then we just take our little business to fix it up. I said, mommy, that's not right. So here is it that there is a fete coming and they assigned me as the acolyte to operate one of the wheels, gambling wheels. <laughs> I said to my, I said to my mother and father again, that cannot be right. I am going to be separate, um, taking care of a wheel gambling right next door to the door where I have to go through to put on my my vestments. I said that, that something cannot be right. She said again, the bishop 
and the priest said yes, therefore you can't say no. I said something is wrong. I said, mommy, no, 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 no. I'm looking in my Bible to find all these kind of things and nothing is going the right way. I don't see no gambling. I don't see nothing like that. Something is wrong. At 69 time, Philip, remember, it was Rasta time. And my mother said, you know what? It looked like you're going to be a Rasta man or an Adventist. She said, you look like you're going to be a Rasta man or an Adventist. And I found that, not strange, but special. So fast forward that I'm looking in my Bible to find out some of the things that seem not to be correct. So one day I'm going through my books and I realize that our catechism has a different ten of ten commandments to the Bible. Every time I see my friend Cocox, me and Cocox went to school together. <laughs> I said to my parents again, how come that Exodus 20 verse 8 speaks to the Sabbath? And when I look in the catechism, it is not number four, it is number three. And one missing. I said there is one missing. So if then the Bible is the inspired word of God. Who gives permission to change the inspired word of God? And my mother and father gave me the typical answer. If your bishop and your priest not telling you nothing different, how can you as a young man say these things? Well, of course, I continue going through the normal life, but I'm fighting there's a battle going on because I want to I want to follow the world with the music and the dancing and the everything. But every time I do something in my mind, say, that's not supposed to be right. No. But what do you do? You're going through. So I'm struggling and I'm going up Wall Street where the Adventist school was back in the day. And the church. My friend said that as Catholics, we have to have Roman crusade with the Adventist students. Well, I have never been a, a, a fighter. I have always been a lover. So I never wanted to fight. I just wanted to look to see if Bernadine and everybody look good. That kind of thing. Well, Trouble started, of course, because young men going up to go try to fight with other young men at the school. And one particular day, all the men left, and I alone going up the road. And I turned my head through the gate. And a soft breadfruit hit me right there. I saw light. Brother Victor, I saw light. I shifted the gear. And when I reached by Mr. Aaron, I shift again. And when I reached Arrow, I shift again. And I said to myself, you see how foolishness could have created serious trouble. I was thankful that it was a soft breadfruit rather than a hard one. All these things were helping the battle going through as to what would happen. And so I keep on asking questions. Fast forward to secondary school. And I'm in fifth form. And one of the persons who I fell in love with was an Adventist lady. Well, of course, she was telling me that if we are to get together, I have to fix my business. Friday, I like to play cricket. Saturday, I want to play cricket. Sunday, we want to play cricket. You name it. And she said, no, because the book says 
you have to respect the Sabbath. No, so I am tormented. And it happened that I left secondary school to go to Jamaica to study. When I reached Jamaica, and I am there, and you left from 10,000 population of Montserrat, and you go to Jamaica with one point something million. And when you go downtown Kingston, and the, the stores open, and the business open, and you see how many young ladies, you say to yourself, my goodness, I'm in trouble. I am in trouble. So I am out there looking, the eyes looking. And I'm on campus, and a new batch of students were coming. And my wife, which is we're heading up for 40 years, she is walking with her suitcase. And I heard a spirit or a, the Lord said, that one is yours. And I said to me, that one, Dominique, eh? That one is yours. And I'm looking at her and observing how she's operating on campus, but not talking to her, just seeing how she's behaving. It happened fast forward that she was a Catholic before, but had just become an Adventist. Now the program mash up again because... I have to play cricket for the, the, the school team and the, the games are on Saturday. And I'm begging her, please come and see me playing so that you could see your, your boy looks good. And she says, thank you very much, but no thank you. So here it is that by the time I'm getting ready to come back to Montserrat, I said to myself, that Paul, if the Lord tell me she's mine, then I'm supposed to make it mine. And I tell her, listen, this, this foolishness can't continue. We need to get married and fix up this business. So we get back to Montserrat. Here goes mommy again. Mommy found the solution and said, if the two of you go on to get married, the easy thing to do is go to Catholic because she was already Catholic. And she already have the papers. So go back to Catholic. Mercy Lord, you obey and you take your fifth commandment. You honor to the father, your father and your mother, right? So here I go. And we are married. And I am sticking to my vows. I'm holding to me. This is my wife. I'm behaving with my wife. I'm keeping to my wife. All right, so we're going through. But I am haunted because the more I read and the more I study, I am getting tighter in this system. In, I'm deputizing for the priest now. I've reached to the level where I'm doing a diaconate program and they're sending a priest from Antigua to come and study with me. And the more we are studying is the more I'm going the other direction instead of going where I'm supposed to go. And the Lord has been saying to me, if that man is supposed to know it, why is it that she, he's not answering the things properly based on scripture? He's not telling me this is what the scripture said. So now I am battling and fighting. So I start telling my wife, I say, listen, wifey, I'm in trouble. She said to me, I was on my way and you mash up the program. She said, we, she was on the way, and I did it. I pulled her back. She said, I do not want to go left and right and left and right. So I am battling, and I'm saying, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Fast forward. We're going through. We have the children, three of them, all of that. So now, working with government, of course, I'm busy. Working with government with as many Adventist persons, because that is agriculture. I, all these, brother, brother Joseph, brother John, brother Collins, sister Collins, you name it. Every time I turn, there's an Adventist. 
Good, good Ventus, not bad Ventus. Good Ventus. And they keep, they don't push me too hard. They just give me information. They just, Mister, just keep on studying and listening. And I'm battling with, with, with God. And I say, something is not right. So, fast forward, I'm going all the way through government. And I'm going up and I'm progressing. I'm progressing, of course. So, as I am starting to get ready now for retirement. Because I have to move fast, right? To retirement. I, it's 2011. I'm to re be retired 2013. There's a particular Monday afternoon we have scouts. And I chose to carry the scouts to Mongo Hill. Right around the Mongo Hill. Right. And I let them loose to get guavas, mangoes, did their drilling, all of that. And I said to them, listen, I have a presentation to do to the Pentecostal men group. Because they invited me. So I dropped them home. And I went across to the Braids Pentecostal Church and I did the presentation with the gentlemen. We had a wonderful um, time. And when I was finished and going up Fogarty, something said to me, you know, all the other foolish things you talk about, government and politics and everything, that is what you're supposed to do. That is how the spirit hit me going up. By the time I reached to John, I am high going home. All right. So I got home. Had my shower, get my supper, rest myself. The next day, I was supposed to go to a meeting in cultural center. And I am excited. The governor should be there. All kind of people should be there. And while I am preparing to go to the, the meeting, and in addition, they asked me to say the prayer. You know how the, world, the, the Lord operates? The Lord said that Mr. Scary is supposed to say that prayer. Well, I went to say the prayer. And when I went to say the prayer, I started strange. My chest, my system didn't feel right. And so, I said the prayer. But when I'm sitting back, I'm saying, but I can't remember what I said. And some spirit is saying, but you look like you're praying for yourself because like something wrong with you. So I'm saying, did I say the right prayer for the occasion? Or did I say, God, please help me because something looked like it was strange. I got, I told one friend, I'm heading up to the hospital because they say, if you feel strange and your chest feel funny, go up. When I get to the, the intercept, intersection of, of, of Cars Bay and going up there, Every man seemed to have a question I want to stop me at that particular one. And I'm answering, but I'm trying to get out of there to get up to hospital. And when I got to hospital, it seemed that casualty had too many people. And I said, you know something, I can't pass all the people and go inside. Let me go over the other side. And I went over to the other side. And as I go across the other side, I'm feeling strange. I met a nurse walking, and I said, nurse... I'm not feeling so good. She rubbed my chest and said, Mr. Skerritt, you're never, you're never sick, man. You're all right. You're good. I went in the area, and it was actually a meeting or grouping going inside there. Brother, Brother Ryan was there. I don't know if Brother Ryan is here, but Brother Ryan was there. That same one there. <laughs> and, and I was sitting with Brother Ryan, I maybe Sister Ryan too. And we there chatting. And I said to myself, but wait, you forget yourself. You didn't come to go chat with everybody. You're supposed to go look after yourself. So Nurse Brown passed and I gave, I talked, Nurse Brown said, Nurse Brown, I'm not feeling so good. Nurse Brown said, come. She carried me inside the room and she started to check me. And when I see Nurse Brown's face, I said to myself, well, I am in trouble. She started writing fast on a piece of paper. And she gave me and she said, you need to get back to the other side as fast as possible. In truth and in fact, you shouldn't even drive. Well, I didn't remember what this not drive. I jumped in the truck and I head back on the other side. And when I got to the other side, of course, I 
Nurse Brown already called them the day that I'm coming. And Nurse Braid looking after me in the little room, waiting for me to go across. And I said, Nurse Braid, I need a little water to drink. Give me a little. And I drank the water. And when I finished that water, I saw the whole world turn upside down. And I'm, I'm saying the prayers inside, saying, Lord, help me. When I tell Nurse Braid that, listen, I'm getting worse. Please note, she probably in here somewhere. Nurse Braid is like Dinah Ross weight. It's not heavy boxing weight like me. And I tell everybody, Nurse Braid lift me up or carry me across. And when I got into the other side, nurse, um, Dr. Buffon said, Mrs. Skerritt, take it easy. Relax. You're such a nice man. We don't want anything to happen. We're going to work hard on you. And I hear all kind of instructions, and I got the medication. Fast forward, I'm to Medivac to St. Croix. When I get to the airport, um, uh, Mr. Dyer says to me, Mr. Skerritt, I'm tying you up good in the airplane because we don't want you to fall out. And I find it strange that he's saying that. Anyhow, he says, I'm tying you up properly. And he tied me up properly. You know why? 15 minutes out of St. Croix, my wife and the nurse that accompanied me Started go talking all the time. They're whispering and chat, chat that come in. And all of a sudden, I can't hear no sound. Everything got quiet. The plane started falling out of the sky. I said to Satan, Satan, you are a liar. You tried to kill me in Montserrat. The doctor sent me there to try to fix me up. And you're trying to crash the plane before I reach to say cry. Well, my God, our God is more in charge and is in charge. And you can't crash nothing we're going. Get to the, the, the airport, all kind of ambul ambulance, you name it, there. And I'm going through the back door of the airport of course. Nothing through the thing they, they flashed me through. And I get to the hospital and the, the, the doctor says I have one other patient to operate on and you will be the next one. Well I, I am there saying thank you Jesus has helped me and I'm preparing that you know, my chest is going to bust open and they're going to go in to do whatsoever. That's how I'm thinking. Anyhow when the thing started, it was through my grind coming up to my heart and they operate and I got you. The Lord is in charge. The Lord is in charge. The doctor said, I got you. You are right, Mr. Skerritt. I'm in truth and in fact, we don't want you to stay too long in the hospital to go spend up all kind of money. If you have a nice family member, go there and relax yourself. And I have a contact, contact with you that I can get you back with and forward. And I say, thank you, Jesus. Amen. I am in my cousin's place, one of the cousins. And while I'm there in my cousin's place, another cousin said, listen, I'm going to bring some fish for you so you can get some fish water and strengthen you so guess what? I got my wife prepared the fish water and I had my fish and I went on my bed and relaxing. Well, my stomach started to operate a kind of hope. But I, told, I thought that it was the medication from the operation that is creating the problem. So I'm quickly operating in the people's toilet and go and clean up everything and go back and lie down and come back and I'm doing that. And on the Thursday evening, there's a prayer meeting that happens at, at my cousin's yard in the, his house. And I realize I can't go inside the room there because in case of emergency, we have to be able to get back. 
In addition, I snored so much during the operation that the doctor said I had to take a sleep test. So I went to do the sleep test. At the same time, remember now, you know, I don't know that it is poison. So I did the sleep test, and in the morning, I'm waiting for my wife to come with my cousin and to pick me up. Well, they're not coming. And I'm sitting down and saying, well, what kind of behavior is this? These folks not coming to pick me up. And I'm looking around, nobody. In a matter of so many minutes pass, I see the, the vehicle coming full speed with my cousin, but no wife. I find that strange. My wife abandoned me. No, I mean, she said, God. When my cousin came through, she started saying, you wouldn't understand. You wouldn't accept this. You wouldn't know that what is happening there. I said, what happened? She said, you have to go back to the hospital. No, I'm saying, I'm failing something bad. And then eventually she said, your wife is at the hospital. When I got to the hospital, there was an Asian doctor jumping up like it was carnival <laughs> next to my wife's bed. And I couldn't believe that was my wife who left, who carried me to look after me in St. Croix. She was poisoned. Her, her heartbeat was below 30. They're trying their best to bring up the heartbeat. Now, what am I supposed to say or do? Because your humble servant is the one who had the heart, the heart attack and was supposed to be looked after or, or by and rescued by my wife. But no, missing my wife going there. And I said to myself, my goodness, this can't be right. And she carried her on the same ward where I went. The pastor, right there when I was supposed to be there as the person getting the, 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 thing, the surgery. She now have to get medication. She looks worse than me and she looks like she's going to die. Like she's not going back to Montserrat. And I, say, I said again, Satan, you are a liar. Imagine you try to kill me, you can't get you. You're trying to kill my wife now. I said, that can't happen. Father Jesus, that counterfeit can't work. And little by little, 30 to 40 coming up her heart, coming up, coming up, coming up. And I said to me, I said to, to myself, I said, Lord, when I come back to Montserrat, this staying in between can't work. I need to make a decision. I'm coming back and I start sharing with some folks that I need to change and make my decision. Too long. Too long. I think I met with Brother Victor one time. I said, Brother Victor, I can't continue this thing. This thing have to be have to be done. I have to do something. And so as pastor came through my area, I told to the pastor, I said, Pastor. Your humble servant here already started to talk with all the other Adventist men in near to the neighborhood who are not going to church. I said, Pastor, I tell them, let us go. Once a month at least, let us put in one vehicle and go. And everybody, like we do, we have an excuse. We, we have something to do. We have different things. But at the end of the day, I keep saying, no, Father Jesus, help me. Help me to make the distance. Start, just just go forward. I don't know if I walk with the right clothes to, to baptize, but I'm coming. Yeah. Pastor reached by my house and pastor said, what's up? What you doing? I said, pastor, I don't, I'm a man now. I don't want, I, I reach a certain age where I want to say yeah and nay. When I say a, a yeah is a yeah and a nay is a nay. She says, he said, two possibilities. Today, and I think the 23rd or whatever, two possibilities. And I said, Pastor, as I'm saying, let's go. 
we pray together and we're going. What I'm saying here is that I can't even tell you, as pastor, I may have to tell you more. Because the reason why I was scared, even in St. Croix, is that my mother and father died on the same day in a matter of hours at different locations. So when, me, when I see my wife heading, I say, well, hey, that man had to tell God, I'm taking away the hedge. Are you going, you know? But he had to say, no, the hedge. Okay? So when I, you, you would, I will tell you more about the, the mother and father. But to tell you, mother and father went twice. My brother's wife died in an accident, car accident, with one of his children. So I went to Boston during the crisis to say farewell two plus two. So I said, see Satan coming back for two. <laughs> Ladies, brothers and sisters, young people, this story is a real story. And it has said to me, I have to pass up. The Lord has been directing me. I cannot give you the next one with the stroke that happened. That is for later on. But I went to my ATM and couldn't remember where the numbers were. I couldn't even, you know me, people call me for five minutes, I will give, I'll do a speech. I couldn't speak. I couldn't speak. I tried to look for some words and I couldn't find the words. And the Lord said, no. We will, I will take care of you. Gentle folks, I am sharing this testimony with you to say that many of you have some or maybe similar, but please note, what I have done is because he has been preparing me. What has been doing? He's doing? Preparing me, Brother Philip. When Brother Philip come to paint my house, the two of us talking more than painting. <laughs> It is the connection. Sister Mario, did the shot still all right? Uh, <laughs> we have to, as members of our church, have to do some things and do some things differently. You know what my challenge is on this day? Because downstairs we had three cards. One card for Mongo Hill, one card for New Carmen, and one card for, all right. And I said, low downstairs, I said, please note, I have, I am joining one church. I am joining one church. I'm not waiting for when we get the official documents. I'm telling you early. I am not against Mongo and against, and if that is the case, sorry, wrong number. The Lord don't tell me so. We are to operate in such a way that our only, our only distant direction is to try to get to our heavenly Father. Amen? And so, all I'm saying with you is that my journey has been long from 1969 to 2022. And if I take such a journey to reach here, it's not because I am coming that way. It's because somebody up there has been preparing me. Amen? And so, brother, I know you want to finish the program the right time, so we will do it after, but that is my testimony, part of it, amen? amen, that we have to battle. Brother, brother, brother Ryan, every document you send with me to you in them say, carry it for daddy. Yes. <laughs> yes. Carry it for, yes. <laughs> carry it for daddy. So, we give thanks. Brother, I know you want to get back on thing and the Lord will fix it. We are going to go where we have to go. Amen? amen. Praise be to the Lord. We'll now have the special song.
to die in my place. I will glory in the cross, in the cross lay the suffering holy in vain. I would weep trophies and crowns, my rope stained with sin was all that I had to lay at his feet, unworthy to eat from the table of life until love made provision for me. Come on and say another amen for our sister in the cross. We thank God for the cross today. And it is through that cross and the power of the cross that these sons and daughters will be surrendering their lives to the Lord. And through that cross, we have salvation Salvation is made possible. And today we rejoice in the power of the cross. The devil is a loser. And he continues to be a loser. But we are on the winning side. What a testimony shared. A powerful testimony. And among the things said, I, I note... And I'm glad today for the testimony because I know that some things I said last night, for those of you who were here, was said by our brother. Uh, did you hear it? And he's coming from a Catholic church. 
So I'm, I'm glad that what I said last night, some of the things was confirmed by somebody who used to be a Catholic. God is amazing. He has a way of confirming his word. So you would know the truth of the Bible. And praise God today that he will be surrendering his life to the Lord. I, can I get a little more substance on the mic, please? Um, however possible that is. I am delighted to share this word with you today. And uh, it's a word that we need to pay attention to. For those of you who may still be in the valley of indecision, I believe that God is sending a word today for you to make that cross over into his divine kingdom. I, I want to take your attention to the Old Testament. And um, by now you know that this preacher loved to preach from the Old Testament. Uh, my sermon the first Sabbath was in the Old Testament. My sermon last week was in the Old Testament. And this week is in the Old Testament. And I believe I'll be going back to the Old Testament next Sabbath. I love the Old Testament. But I believe in all of the scripture. Uh, first Kings chapter 18. It's a very familiar story. And uh, it's not new to many of you. I take you from verse 20 through to verse 24. Uh, when you're there, say amen. Don't you look in the New Testament now. It's, I said the Old Testament. Uh, when you're there, say amen. Are you there yet? Good. So Ahab sent unto all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together unto Mount Carmel. And Elijah came unto him, unto all the people, and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God... Follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him, not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I, only remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are four hundred and 50 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and Put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire. Let him be God. And all the people answered. And said it is well spoken. I have chosen to give this uh, message a title, Choose Ye. Choose Ye. Father, we ask you that you will speak in clarion tone to our hearts today. May those in the valley of indecision choose your side today. May the whole thing be stopped. And may they choose you as the supreme God of their life. And now ask that you will hide this 
feeble lump of clay behind the cross may Jesus Christ alone be seen and be lifted up and be magnified in this place. In the end, may we give you the praise, the glory, and the honor. In Jesus' name, amen. We don't know who his parents were. Nor when he was born, we are only told that he was of the inhabitants of Gilead, a place far removed from any of the cities of renown. So self-effacing was he that he never took the time to identify himself. His father was not the high priest of Gilead as Jeremiah's father was of Anathoth. He couldn't even claim the priesthood in his lineage. He didn't have the social awareness of that sycamore tree tender from Tekoa named Amos. He was not called upon to develop his homiletical preaching skill like that clergyman of the cemetery known as Ezekiel. He didn't have any pathos in his preaching nor was, he, was there a tear in his testimony like unto the prophet Jeremiah. And yet he shows up on the pages of Holy Writ. So we, we look at him, this Elijah, who comes to us from a, a funny and a strange place. A place where there was no resume or pedigree. A place where he was not uh, numbered in the who's who. A place where he had no influence or affluence. And yet he shows up on the pages of Holy Writ. History called him the chief of the prophets. But Ahab called him the troubler of Israel. This prophet who hails from the mountain of Gilead. Was a man driven by both a divine imperative and an eternal summon. He was a man of faith and prayer whose fearless ministry was destined to check the rapid speed of apostasy in Israel and a man for whom miracles seemed to be a part of his makeup. You would remember that it was this prophet Elijah who was sent to Ahab under the anointing and power of the Holy Spirit and said to Ahab, Ahab as the Lord God of Israel liveth before whom I stand, there shall not be any dew or rain these years according to my word. Understand that Ahab had led the nation of Israel into unprecedented evil for 22 years. The Bible describes Ahab as the worst king ever in the history of Israel. And informs us that Ahab did more to provoke the Lord than all who were before him. His wife was a woman who was involved in idolatry and witchcraft and immorality and wickedness. And on top of that, Ahab allowed her unprecedented powers. First of all, she killed off as many of God's prophets as she could and caused Ahab uh, to erect a temple in the city, Be made Baal worship the official religion of the kingdom, imported and supported 850. 
the fourth prophet from Israel's payroll and abolished the worship of God. And belief was first separating the chosen nation from the source of their strength. God was being dethroned while Baal was being enthroned. And it seemed as though God was totally obliterated from the mind of his elect. This God who had done such great things for Israel was almost totally forgotten by Israel. This God who carried them on eagle's wings. This God who protected them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. This God who fed them when they were hungry, clothed them when they were naked, befriend them when they were friendless. He delivered them from bondage and gave them a land flowing with milk and honey that they may observe his statues and keep his laws, but they had forgotten about him. And as the prophet Elijah viewed this apostasy and spiritual decadence from his mountain home, he besought God to arrest uh, the once favored people in their course and to visit them with judgments if needs be. Elijah knew that God's wrath towards Israel's uh, spiritual depravity was long overdue. And being a concerned prophet, he wanted to awaken in them a feeling of sincere repentance and to save them from the impending judgment that was about to overspread the land. But he had no influence. He had no pulpit. He had no money. And he had no status symbol except that of a prophet. All he had were two knees and a committed relationship with God. And he knew how to pray. Are you hearing me today? He knew that God said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their land. And I just wonder today if anybody in this place knows that God still answers prayer. Does anybody know that God's ears are open to our cry? Does anybody know that prayer will cause the deaf to hear symphony and the blind to take a stroll in the park? Prayer will lock the mouths of lions and turn a blazing inferno into ear condition. Prayer will nauseate a whale, gave it indigestion, and cause it to vomit Jonah on a beach. I stop by here to let somebody know that prayer opened prison door and set jailers free. I said, I stop by here to let somebody know that prayer burst the bands of dead asunder and expanded uh, heaven. I stop by here to let somebody know that prayer shut the gate of hell and put demons to flight. 
Prayer raised the dead and healed the sick. Prayer rescued city from destruction and hung up the sun in Gibeon and the moon in the valley of Ajalon. Prayer extinguished wars and appeased angry element. Hear me today. Whatever your situation, God has given you two knees and he says, I'm just a prayer away. If you call on me, I'll answer ya. Prayer is still powerful, and Elijah knew the value of prayer. Uh, do I have a witness who can testify uh, that before we call, uh, he will answer us. Uh, and while we are yet speaking, he will hear us. Somebody who can testify, he may not come uh, when you want him, but he's always uh, on time. For came on time. He died on time. He was buried on time. He resurrected on time. He ascended on time. And he's coming back on time. He's an on time God. Yes he is. And so Elijah prayed until one day God appeared to him and told him that he had heard his prayers. And as a week a result of his prayers, uh, there would be no rain until Elijah asked for it. God gave Elijah the key to open and shut heaven that there be no rain until Elijah asked for it. God told him, go and inform Ahab that there will be no rain for three and a half years. In obedience to the divine command, Elijah set out on his errand with the message to the king on reaching the palace he did not concern himself with the security details nor was he careful to observe protocols he solicited no admission nor waited to be formally welcomed and introduced to the king he was not clad in any priestly or kingly regalia but he was clad in a coarse garments usually worn by the prophets he passed the guards apparently unnoticed and stood for a moment before the frightened king he made no apology for his abrupt appearance. For a greater than the ruler of Israel had commissioned him to speak. God said, go tell Ahab. There will be no rain. The word of faith and power upon his lips and his whole life was devoted to the work of reformation. See Elijah standing before the monarch, this powerful king. See him standing before him, lifting up his hands towards heaven. Elijah affirmed by the word of the living God that there will be judgment in Israel. There will be no rain. For three and a half years, then suddenly, like a thunderbolt from a clear sky, the message of impending judgment fell on the ears of Ahab. And before Ahab could recover from his surprise and form a reply, Elijah disappeared, taking with him the key of heaven. For three and a half years, there would be no rain nor do you in Israel. Understand that Israel had apostatized and broken down the altars of God. Israel had forsaken their relationship with God and set up 
uh, altars inside the temples and offered sacrifices to Baal on high places. Offering, understand that the offering consisted of the first fruit of the harvest. Animals and even human were sacrificed to Baal. Large images of Baal were set up in the temples. And smaller ones were displayed in their home. And I pause here to say you may not have a physical Baal image in your home. You may not have an image carved out of stone or wood or whatever else. But whatever you put in front of God becomes your idol. Whatever is given first place in your heart becomes your idol. Whatever is standing and in between you and God so you can't cross over the line and make a committed decision to follow him in baptism it's your idol but I'm glad to know that Jesus can deal with idols I'm glad to know that he can remove idol he can cast out the foe I'm glad to know that Jesus says those who come to him, he will in no wise cast out. Are you hearing me? Baal was set up in the temples and in their homes. Images of four food and beasts were set up in some villages and were kissed and adored by Baal's subjects. The priests would often sacrifice children by carving them with knife, placing the parts of the body on an altar with fire under it, offering it as burnt offering to Baal. Well, the hillsides were dotted with groves and other stuff. As the religious leaders of Baalism publicly practiced these immoral sex acts, the people of Israel gave vent to their own lustful passions and adultery became the norm. Daughters with father and mother with son and brother with sister and in-laws with in-laws. Such were the despicable, depraved acts carried out by the sons of the covenant, the elect of God, God's children. And as a result of Israel's apostasy, a divine judgment broke out in the land. Uh, and now the apostate tribe of Israel were to be shown the folly of trusting in their powerless idols. Oh, my favorite writer, the writer to the remnant church, said in Patriarchs, uh, Prophets and Kings, rather, page 127, the apostasy of Israel was an evil more dreadful than all the multiplied horrors of famine. As such, there would be no rain in the land of Israel. For three and a half years, the earth would be dry and barren. Uh, but understand that the parched condition of drought in the physical order was merely symbolic of the drought which had already taken place in the spiritual order of the nation. The nation was dry, spiritually deformed. Ah, the nation was dry for righteousness was dethroned and it was seen as a detestable thing. And whenever that happens in a nation, the people are in trouble. You didn't hear me. I said whenever God is not center stage in a nation, the people in that nation are in trouble. For righteousness still exhausts a nation. And sin is a reproach to any people. And so during the 
time of the drought, vegetations were destroyed. Stream dried up, lowing herds and bleating, flo uh, bleating flocks wandered hither, thither, and yon, seeking survivor. The groves decorated to idol worship became leafless. The forest trees afforded no shade. The air became suffocating, and thirst and hunger were the constant companions of men and beasts. Yet for all these apostate Israel and her diabolic king did not repent of their folly and turn to God. And so in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah summoned all Israel together along with the false prophets who sat at Jezebel's table to meet him on Mount Carmel. Now, now understand that Mount Carmel was an ideal place for the contest to be held because Mount Carmel was thought of as a sacred place throughout ancient history. The Canaanites built sanctuaries to pagan gods on the site and incidentally Baal was also called the Lord of Carmel. Are you following me? Thus, Carmel was an appropriate site for a confrontation between Elijah, the prophet of the Lord, and the prophets of Baal. Elijah said, let's go up to higher ground. I want to rise above the tenets of your sin, above the smell of your burning incense above your wickedness and uh, pollution. Let's go up to higher ground. Let's go to a place where everyone can see what is about to take place. Those from near and those from far. You see, Jezebel had urged Ahab to oppose the worship of God, destroy his altars, and kill his prophets. And now proper religious decorum must be restored. The broken down altars must once again be erected. God and God alone must be respected, venerated, and worshipped. So Elijah, let's go up to higher ground. And so in this old time, Holy Ghost, heaven born, hell shaking, Death killing revival. Elijah the mighty and victorious defender of the cause of God. Stood firmly against the extreme paganism of his day. He was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. To rebuke sin and press back the tide of evil. Having summoned the people uh, together Elijah stood in the midst of them unashamed and undaunted fully aware of his commission to execute the divine command he looked at the torn down altar of the Lord and said to the people how long halt ye between two opinions if the Lord be God follow him and if Baal then follow him Elijah knew whose side he was on Baal's prophets knew whose side they were on but Israel couldn't make up their minds they were fence, strugglers, compromises, and were halting between two opinions. So Elijah said, it's time to make up your mind. Uh, which is it? Who will you serve? Is it Baal or is it he who spoke and it was done, commanded, and it stood fast is it Baal or is it he who walked on the springs of the sea and numbered the clouds in his wisdom is it Baal or is it he who stepped out on the balcony of nothing with nothing before him and nothing beside him and nothing beneath him spoke to nothing and created the world out of nothing is it Baal or is it he who measured the earth in the palm of his hand 
and weigh the mountains in scale. Who will you serve? You can't keep putting off Christ. It is time for you to make a decision. A decision must be made. You must choose between wrong and right. Hell or heaven. Righteousness or unrighteousness. You must make a decision. How many sermons must you hear before you make a decision for Christ? How many Bible workers must come to your home before you make a decision for Christ? How many more pestilence must rage in your nation and mine before we make a decision for Jesus Christ? How many more preachers must preach God's word? Some of you have been coming night after night, Sabbath after Sabbath to this campaign and you are still in the river on the bank it's time for you to make a decision some of you have been wavering you have been wondering if I give my life to Christ or am I going to survive but didn't you read where the Bible says David say I was young and now I'm old but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread his eyes are on the sparrow and I know he will take care of me what he wants you to do is to let go and let God step over the line and he has promised that if you accept him he will cause you to ride on the high places of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob. I'm glad that is my bread when I'm hungry. I'm glad that is my water when I'm thirsty. I'm glad that is my doctor in my sick room. I'm glad that is my lawyer in my courtroom. I'm glad that is my bridge over troubled water. And what he asks you to do is to obey him. But when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory. I said what a glory. What a glory. He sheds on our way while we do his good will. He abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. I said it's time for you to make a decision. This may not be your first sermon but it may be your last. I told you some night ago, all the devil wants is to kill you in your sin. He wants you to put off your soul salvation. He wants you to procrastinate. And he whispers in your ears that you have time. Well, time has not promised to any of us. Jesus says today, if you hear his voice, hold not your heart. Don't you hear the Holy Spirit plead him? Don't you feel the knocking at your heart's door? Jesus says, come now, now, not tomorrow, now, not next week, now, not next year. Come, let us reason together. Though your sin be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can be as wool. I stop by here to let you know that there's power. Wonder working power in the blood of Jesus. There's power to set you free today. And he's asking you to make a decision. Understand that there's no middle ground. You have to make up your mind. These saints will be taking their stand in the water in a little while have made up their minds and God will keep you from falling and present you faultless before his throne there are others who should be sitting where they are sitting maybe this week you made a decision uh, for Christ but the devil whispered in your ears to put it off until further time 
Don't be like Felix. To whom Paul went and he said, I'm almost persuaded. Come back at another convenient time. We never read where Felix accepted Christ. Oh, beloved, we have to make a decision. You have to make up your mind. Is it a Christ or the devil? It's either sin or righteousness. It's either heaven or hell. But you got to make a choice. The Bible says in verses 22 to 24. I'm coming down shortly. Verses 22 to 24. The Bible says, and Then said Elijah unto the people, I even, I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood and put no fire under and I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under and call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answereth I said the God that answereth by fire let him be God and all the people answered, sir, it is well spoken. Now, 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 understand that there are three significant and important reasons why the contest surrounded the ability of the deity to send fire. Number one, fire is an indication of the presence of God. Fire is seen as accompanying the appearances of God. In this way, the contest was asking the respective deities to show themselves. Number two, fire is connected to ba Baal as the lightning and storm god. As a storm god, Baal is depicted with lightning bolts in his hand and it was believed that he could hurl bolts of fire from heaven to rule the enemy or consume anything that might cause them to suffer defeat. So if Baal was God, he should be able to send fire. Oh, it was even thought that Baal used fire as a means of constructing his house. Baal was therefore considered by his worshippers as the lord of fire. Therefore the ability to send fire should not be a, a difficult thing uh, for him if he was God. Number three. Fire represents the acceptance of the sacrifice. Burnt offerings of this sort typically accompanied petition uh, in this case the petition on everyone's mind was for the drought to end are you hearing me so if both parties had been praying for the drought to end the resulting rain could be attributed uh, by either group to its own god as a result the contest is set up to demonstrate which deity is responding to the deity, uh, the, the petition rather, of his followers. If fire is sent, the petition has been granted. And the rain that follows could be attributed to the correct deity. Are you following? It is therefore important to recognize the close connection between the sending of the fire and the sending of the rain and so the false priests and prophets of Baal they chose a bullock and dress it and cut it in pieces and put it on the altar 
and began calling on their God to answer by fire. They called, but nothing happened. Here now their cries echoing through the forests and surrounding hills. See the priests, if you can, gathered about the altar. Watch them as they leaped like fools upon their altar as if they would themselves become sacrifices with their bullock. Look at them as they tear their hair out and cut their flesh with lanchets and knives like madmen hoping to get a response from their dead God. Hear them as they beseech Baal to help. And the morning came, noon came, and there was no evidence by fire that Baal had heard the cries of his deluded followers. There was no voice, no reply to their frantic prayers. Uh, the sacrifice remained unconsumed and Baal remained powerless and dead. After they tried all their foolishness and their dumb God didn't answer, they resorted to dancing, hoping to stir his emotion and response. Uh, but their dead God could not come to their rescue, for he had mouth but he couldn't speak, hands but couldn't save, eyes but couldn't see, feet but couldn't move, ears but couldn't hear, nose but couldn't smell. He had a head, but he had no brain inside. Baal was a brainless God. My favorite writer says that Satan was standing by ready to light the fire. But he was restrained. He was restricted. He, he would have wanted to light the fire to demonstrate that Baal was a God. But understand uh, that God always has the final say and the ultimate power. Understand that there's no God like Jehovah. There's no God beside him. He's, he's God all by himself. And he knows when to keep Satan under our feet. That is why I don't uh, concern myself how he huffs and puffs and behaves like a bully. God has a way to control him. God will give him enough rope, but God still can hold the rope and pull him in. And therefore, God says, don't be afraid of the devil. When you make a decision for me, I'll keep you, I'll wrap you in my bosom, I'll shelter you under my wing. Don't be afraid of the terror by night. Then said Elijah to them, mocking them, cry aloud, for he's a God. Either he's talking or he's pursuing or he's on a journey somewhere. Maybe he's distracted by a conversation and he's too busy to deal with you now. Cry some more. Perhaps he's gone to the bathroom. Perhaps he is gone on vacation and you will have to wait until he's back. Perhaps he is taking his afternoon siesta and you will have to scream louder in his ears to wake him up. But cry some more. Uh, Dr. G. S. Faber in his book, A Region of Pagan Idolatry, says that Elijah is not simply ridiculing the worship of the idolatrous priest. He is not taunting them, as it were, at random, but he is ridiculing their senseless adoration based upon their own knowledge, uh, pre uh, knowledge principles. That sometimes Baal is re represented by his followers as wrapped in profound 
meditation, sometimes sleeping, and sometimes taking a long journey. So all day long the people had witnessed the demonstration of the baffled priests. They beheld their wild leaping around the altar as if they would grasp the burning rays of the sun to serve their purpose. But now it was Elijah's turn to call upon God who neither slumbers nor sleep. I'm glad that God is not like Baal. We can call him whenever we want him. And he's always there. I'm glad we can call him in the morning. We can call him at midday. We can call him at evening. We can call him 24 hours a day. And he's always on the business to listen to us. He says, call at me in the time of trouble. And I will be there to rescue you. God is always open to listen to the cry of his children. And so, as they came near, Elijah turned to the broken down altar where God used to be worshipped. He turned to the broken down altar where sweet smelling incense used to ascend to the very nostrils of God. He turned to the broken down altar where sacrifices used to be offered. And, he, and as he turned to the broken down altar, he said in verses 31 and 32, the Bible said that Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the son of Jacob unto whom the word of the Lord came saying Israel shall be thy name and with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. Elijah used these 12 stones to erect the altar. Each stone representing the 12 tribes of Israel as a testimony unto and against them. In verses 35, 33 to 35, the Bible says that Elijah put wood in order and cut the bullocks in pieces and lay him on the wood and said fill three four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood and he said do it the second time and they did it the second time and he said do it the third time and they did it the third time and the water ran about the altar and he filled the trench with water now now, now I, I don't know if you uh, know anything about wet wood wet wood can't light when I was a little boy and my mother before I had the benefit of of, of stove my mother would send me to get wood to catch the fire and to cook. And I had just two options. Get the wood so the dinner can be prepared or don't get the wood and die of hunger. And so I would go out and I would look for a certain kind of wood. Uh, sweet wood and guava wood. Those kind of wood that blaze. But, but one of the things I used to ensure is that this wood that I'm taking home is not wet. Because wet wood cannot light. And sometimes I would make the mistake. And I would pick up some that was not so dry. And I would try to catch the fire. And I would blow until thine kingdom come. Sometimes when I was blowing and was drunk by smoke. You guys in Montserrat don't know all of that. You guys are privileged. You have an electric stove and gas stove. You, know, you don't look wood. You don't know the smoke and drunk individuals. I will literally be drunk 
because the wood was wet. And sometimes when I would catch something thin and fan, try to find the flame, nothing would happen. And I wonder in the story why Elijah said that they must fill four barrels and pour the water on the wood uh, three times. Not just one, not just two, but three I wonder and I try to use my sanctified imagination and I wonder why not seven because seven is the perfect number in scripture. Why not ten because ten is the perfect number in the Hebrew language but Elijah said fully one time, fully two times. Fully three times. And I discover that what Elijah was saying was. Full one for the Holy Spirit. One for the Father. One for the Son. Elijah was calling on the Godhead to show himself. Elijah called. And what did the Bible say? The Bible says in verses 36 through 40. Then said he unto them, because thou hast not. Oh, I'm reading chapter 20, verses 36 through 40 of chapter 18. The Bible says, and it came to pass at the time of the evening sacrifice. Ah, that Elijah, the prophet, came near and said, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, God of Israel, let it be known that thou art God and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy command. Hear me, O oh Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou turned their heart back. Then the fire, you're not hearing me, then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stone and the dust and licked up the water. And when they or the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is the God. The Lord is the God. And Elijah said unto them, Take the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they took them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishron. And slew them there. I wonder why Elijah did that. Didn't the people say the Lord is the God? It sounded to me like confession. It sounded to me like they had turned their hearts to God. It sounded to me like they had repented and they are now forsaken Baalism and accepted God. But the Bible said that Elijah took them down to the brook and killed them. Couldn't understand it, Pastor Nixon, until I consulted the spirit of prophecy. And the servant of the Lord said, these false worshippers confessed with their mouth. But their heart was not in their confession. She further said that had Elijah allowed them to live, they would have corrupted Israel worse than before. So God said to Elijah, get rid of them. God doesn't want lip service. He wants heart service. He doesn't want lip service and the tradition of men. He wants you and me to serve him from our hearts. You have to make a decision today. You need to cross the line. 
into God's kingdom. You have to choose Baal or Jesus. Life or death. You have to choose Christ or the devil. Maybe you would have come today. You should be robed. You made your decision in the week. But you have decided that somewhere between last night and this morning. Not to follow through with your decision. It's time to choose between Christ or Baal. Heaven or hell. Sin or righteousness. Or maybe you didn't sign up any card for baptism. But you've been coming out to these meetings. And you have been hearing the word of God being preached. You know what this preacher has been saying is correct from scripture. And the water will be troubled. These precious sons and daughters of God today will be surrendering their lives. And you want to take a stand. We have rope. We have gown. Is Evangelist Harriet here? We got gowns. I want to make this call today for somebody who is in the valley of indecision. Somebody who needs Savior. You are saying, I'm tired. I'm sick and tired of sin. I'm sick and tired of the abuse of the enemy. I'm sick and tired of trying everything. I've tried liquor. I've tried sex. I've tried drugs. I've tried everything and they have failed. And it seems as though I don't know which way to turn. I'm tired of this life. And you want to try Jesus today. You want to take your stand. I invite you to take your stand. We have gone for somebody today who want to make a crossover into God's kingdom. And as the church is standing and as Evangelist Harriet is coming, if there is such an individual, I invite you to come. Take a mic, Evangelist Harriet. Let me turn this thing over to you. If there is somebody today wrestling with their conscience, I invite you to come. Tomorrow is promised to nobody. While the blood is running warm in your vein, come and let God take control. Let us all stand together. As we sing powerfully, a matter of fact, we pause for a moment. We we pause for a moment. The time is well spent. But for some reason, the Holy Spirit is extending. And this extension is not for you. It is for me. I don't know if you see where it makes sense for you as well. But one of the deepest concerns since I landed here in Monsterot, I have been doing some personal introspection of my life. You don't know me that much, but God has done a lot in my personal life. I've walked with presidents and great men. and I've been in places where I never dreamed I've ever been. I've walked the dusty road of Jerusalem and Palestine. I've been where Jesus have been in Jordan and 
Dead Sea and sail in the Sea of Galilee. I've baptized hundreds and thousands. But since I came here, I, I've been doing a personal evaluation. And I said to myself, how can I and how should I allow all that I have seen and been, persons I've been with, allow my personal decisions to stop me from gaining what Jesus has in store for me. I'm going to be frank and I'm going to pray afterward. Don't, don't, don't write me off, brethren, but I'm going to tell you something from my heart. I have a problem with God. I, I have a problem with God. And the problem I have with God is that I want to do things how I want it to be done. I want God to work on my terms, not his terms. I think that God should come when I want him to come. And God doesn't work like that. God knows what best for me. And he knows what best for you. I can say this. I have not had any conversation with anybody, not even your pastor, since I came here. But I'm going to say something that may cause you to wonder why I say it. This church needs a revival. I didn't say that on my own. Because I know I would have lost some of your friendship after saying it, but I didn't care. This church needs a revival. When Pastor Lou and myself sat at our dear friend, the former bishop or priest from the Catholic Church, what is his name again? When we prayed together, tears came to my eyes. I don't know if you saw it. But the, the weight, the burden that lifted after finished praying, I had to cry. I said, God, if this is the only candidate for baptism and Sabbath, heaven will rejoice. Amen. There are a lot of persons in the church who believe that they are members because we are a loving church, but you have faltered. You have made mistakes to the point where you should have been disfellowship. But because we are a loving church, we welcome you into the sanctuary. But if you do not change your ways, you cannot be welcome in God's kingdom. There's somebody today who needs a special prayer. I'm not asking you to raise your hand to please me. But look, close your eyes. Bow your heads where you are. Think about the life that you have lived. Think about where you are. Think about what you have done. And if you truly discover that if Christ based on the life that you are now living and what you have lived, if Jesus comes today, you can't be saved. Raise your hand. So raise them, raise them, raise them. If you believe that you, what you have done, if Jesus should come today, you cannot be saved. Just raise your hand one by one. One by one. I see them going up one by one. I see, no, keep them up. 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 One by one. You, you, you left. You walked away. You had children out of wedlock. You came back and you thought everything is all right. But you need Jesus. Come on, raise your hand. 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 Raise those hands. Raise those hands. Raise those hands. All I'm going to do is pray. That's all. Nothing more. 
Raise those hands. Raise those hands. Raise those hands. Raise those hands for Jesus. Come on. Shove them in the devil's face. Come on. Put them up. Put them up. Put them up. Come on. Raise those hands. Raise those hands. Lift them in the devil's face. Come on. Show the devil is a liar. He's a liar. Raise those hands. The devil is a liar. Hallelujah. Come on, church. Give God all the praise. Come on. Lift your hand and shout hallelujah. Come on. Lift your hand and say thank you, Jesus. Come on. Lift your hand and say, Lord, you have done it again. <laughs> oh, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. ask all those with their hands raised walk for the prayer walk for the prayer walk for the prayer come down come on walk for the prayer come for the prayer come for the prayer come for the prayer all those who have raised hands come for the prayer it's a very short prayer don't worry I'm done I'm done come for the prayer come for the prayer come for the prayer keep your mask on if you can Come for the prayer. Come for the prayer. Come on down. Come on. Come on down. 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 Oh God, help me, Holy Ghost. Help me, Holy Ghost. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Doesn't matter. Member, none member. Doesn't matter who you are. Come on down. Come on. Come on. Come on down. Doesn't matter who you are. Member, none member. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. They're coming. Come on, church. They're coming. They're coming. Bow your heads and pray. Come on, bow your heads and pray. They're coming. One by one, they're coming. One by one, they're coming. Mm, thank you, Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. They're coming one by one. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Those who did not have the courage. I see you, sister. I see you. I see you. I'm waiting on you. Are you coming? God will bless you. I see you. You know why you are. You know why you're coming? I don't want nobody question anybody life out here. Let God deal with it. Come on. We have too much judge in the church. Too much people who like to believe that their life is somebody else's life is their life and they should determine their future. I, uh, you may not like my style, but I'm a plain preacher. Plain preacher. I call it by how it is, by its name. I don't want anybody to go to any of these persons who walk to the altar. They had the courage they came because they had a reason to have come. And we're not condemning not one of them. I was only hoping I could get all the names, but I guess if you know them, identify them. If you can get the names off the word, oh God, I must bless the Lord. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. I want to say before I pray. Uh, if you want to join the baptism, the recommitment today, there are gowns. Uh, we're not forcing nobody. We're making it. Did I say that? Did I say that? No, no, no. Did I say that? We're not forcing nobody. But we are loving people. Come on, say amen. amen. Come on, say amen. amen. What are we doing? What are we doing? Say that with me. We're not doing what? Forcing nobody. But what are we doing? If you keep loving the members this place, you have to build another church like this size and bigger. All the virgin wants is love. All Jesus asks you to do is to love one another. Amen, somebody? And even though they might have done something wrong, correct them in love. Because all of us messed up, you know. Even some on the board who would pass that the membership of the church should disfellowship them. Check their history. We may not be what we ought to be, but we are not what we used to be after we meet Jesus. Every saint, every saint has a past. And every sinner has a future. Don't kill me. Not because I did some stuff in the past. Don't kill me. The church is a hospital. Come on, say amen. Yeah, it's about Father and the God. We worship you today. 
We don't know about next week's Sabbath for baptism. And many persons are open that they will be in it. Father, if I do that, I will be going against your principles. The watchman, you have placed him on the wall and he has done his part in warning. Father, the waters, they are troubled. And we ask that today, those who are at the altar will say, Mr. Devil, this is it. My mind has changed. I never thought that I would be at this altar. And I never think that I would ever be in that water. But today is my day. Thank you for the victory, Jesus. Thank you for the miracle that has been wrought. Thank you for the moving of your Holy Spirit. And Father, please forgive us of our sins that we have known and not known about. And so that when you burst the sky, these 12, including those who will be, will say this is our God. Empower the preacher once again. Give him that courage to keep preach the undiluted gospel. Thank you for Pastor Louis. Bless him as he goes in the water. Be with the deacon and the deaconesses as a church. Let us give our best of you this week, upcoming week. Let the nights be like this, God. Please, Jesus. We have only a week to go and we seek your support. We seek your help. Thank you for hearing. Thank you for answering. And now that which you refuse to confess... We pray, God, that you will give us the courage to confess them. Be with those who didn't have the courage to come. Those who, who are worshiping with us online. Those who have written in the chat. Those who have asked for special prayer. We ask you will cover the entire family. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the message. Save us when you come. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just before you move, just before you move, for those who, who have come, if you believe that you want to recommit your life today, you can stay. If not, you're free to go back to your seats. If you want to recommit your life today, you can stay. Stay at the altar today, today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. You have decided to surrender today. Standing beside her, standing beside her. I don't know why the tears are coming down, but we had a talk last night. I went home, I went to bed after three this morning. But I prayed for you like I've never prayed before. Pastor Louis, come. Just a minute.
Okay, as you know, we normally do vows to our candidates in the presence of everyone. It's like getting married, getting married to Jesus. And you're going to commit your life to him. And we want to be specific in those commitments. You have been given, given a pledge card. And one of you have my own personal baptismal certificate that I have. It's almost torn and battered and bruised as a very important document of mine personally. And you have read it carefully and the decisions have been made. So you want to publicly come and make up those pledges. We want to invite you to please come up. All those of you who are to be baptized, come up and make a line here as we go to the church to accept you as members of the church Amen. pending your baptism. Um, she has a baby on her. Yeah, one of you just hold the baby. All right, she doesn't have to come up with a baby. All right, can someone just hold her? There you go. Can someone hold a baby for her, please? Could come up some more. Come up some more. Amen. Amen. I guess you have recognized that we have some new candidates and some recommitment. Just come up a bit, come up a bit. Amen. Um, Evangelist Harriet, can you just double check downstairs for Tiffany? Yes, because we're going to wait for her. And brethren, this is why we do what we do. To usher men into, men and women into the kingdom of God. This is what Jesus sends us to do. And heaven is open right now. The doors of heaven are wide open. To receive those wonderful sons and daughters of God. And those who are recommitting to publicly say, Satan, you are history. And now it is Jesus and I. We have a good thing going on. And we are going to read the vows. We are waiting on Tiffany. And while we are waiting on Tiffany, we could do a song. We could do a song. Yeah, we'll get you the mic. You could probably do it a cappella. Look, one of you raise the song. Okay. 
Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Of course, we have the baptismal vows. We will do it. And after which we will have a word of prayer. Those who have the transportation, we have identified them already. And those who need the transportation, we have identified them already. So, Sister Shamin, you will take those that are coming with the... Those that are going on the bus, Sister Shaman, you will take them afterwards. We are prepared to do the vows. All right. Getting married to Jesus. And we are asking you to raise your hands as a show. You might not be able to hear all of you at one time. But we are asking everyone to raise your hands as showing that you accept the vows that are being called out. We have 13 of them when, when, when we give the vows. Okay. You put them up as showing that you accept the vows. Father, may you be through this process and help us and help the candidates as they make this choice and this decision for you in Jesus' name. Amen. First vow. Do you believe that there is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a unity of three co-eternal persons? Do you? All right. Do you accept the death of Jesus Christ on Calvary as the atoning sacrifice for your sins and believe that by God's grace through faith in his shed blood you are saved from its sins and penalties? Do you? All right. Do you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, believing that God in Christ has forgiven your sins and given you a new heart and do you renounce the sinful ways of the world? Do you? All right. Do you accept by faith the righteousness of Christ, your intercessor, your high priest in the heavenly sanctuary, and accept his promise of transforming grace and power to live a loving, Christ-centered life in your home and before the world? Do you? All right. Do you believe that the Bible is God-inspired word? The only rule of faith and practice for the Christian. Do you covenant to spend time regularly in prayer and Bible study? Do you? All right. Do you accept the Ten Commandments as a transcript of the character of God and a revelation of his will? Is it your purpose by the power of the indwelling Christ to keep this law? including the fourth commandment, which requires the observance of the seventh day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord and the memorial of creation. Do you? All right. Do you look forward for the soon coming of Jesus, the blessed hope, when this mortal shall put on immortality? As you prepare to meet the Lord, will you witness to his loving salvation by using your talents in personal soul-winning endeavors to help others to be ready for the glorious appearing of Jesus. Do you? All right. Do you accept the biblical teachings of spiritual gifts and believe that the gift of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of the remnant church? Do you? All right. Do you believe in church organization? Is it your purpose to worship God and to support the church through your tithes and offerings and your personal efforts and influence. Do you? All right. Do you believe that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? And will you honor God by caring for it, avoiding the use of that which is harmful, and abstaining of, from all unclean foods, from the use, manufacture, and sale of alcoholic beverages, from the use, manufacture, and sale of tobacco in any of its forms for human consumption, and from the misuse or of trafficking in narcotics and other drugs. Do you? All right. Do you know and understand the fundamental principles as taught by the Seventh-day Adventist Church that is preached in this crusade night after night? Do you purpose, by the grace of God, to fulfill His will by ordering your life in harmony to these principles, do you? All right. One before the last. Do you accept the New Testament teaching of baptism by immersion and desire to be so baptized as a public expression of faith 
in Christ and his forgiveness of your sins. Do you? All right. And this is the one where we accept them into membership. Do you accept and believe that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of Bible prophecy? And that people of every nation and race and language are invited and accepted into its fellowship? Do you desire to be a member of this local congregation of the world church? Do you? All right, thank you. We have new life, we have new Carmel, and we have new Ebenezer represented here. And we have the membership of the three congregations. When we were giving out the cards for registration for baptism, we had colors designated as per congregation. And one good member who has been baptized, he said, Pastor, there is one Seventh-day Adventist church on the island. <laughs> yes, one of them said to me, there is one Seventh-day Adventist church on this island. But we worship in different congregations on the island. Amen? And I was very pleased by that statement. And we are making the vote as one island church for them. Amen? So can someone move that we accept them in membership pending the baptism? It's moved. Is it seconded? All right, praise the Lord. Hands going up and waving all around the place, and we're taking vote. Yeah. I say we're taking a vote to accept you into membership in Monstrat as the Seventh-day Adventist Church. All those in favor? Show by uplifted right hand. Put them right up. Put them up. Come on, do like Elder Victor. Stand if you want to accept them into. Come on, stand, 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 and hands up. Amen and amen. Put your hands down. Put your hands down. Make sure you put your hands down and sit down. And we're going to, we have to give the other part of it to it for it to be completed. All opposed by the same sign. The eyes have it. <laughs> we could say, welcome as Seventh-day Adventist members of this island church. Come on, put your hands together for them, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Amen. And amen. So we're going to the waters right away. Amen. We'll ask the preacher to pray for us that the Lord give us safe travel and that everything goes well. Brother Glassford, everything is prepared? Okay. I will be in the water. We will have a speaker on the outside and we'll ask the evangelist and the evangelist, the evangelist um, Anthony Taylor and also evangelist Harriet to be the one making the pronouncement while the baptism is done. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for the power of the word of God. We thank you for the gospel. And we thank you for these, your children, who have responded to the pleading voice of your Holy Spirit. We ask you, God, that you will keep them faithful, keep them committed, so that when it pleases you to come, they will hear from your lips, well done. As we go to the place of baptism, we ask for journey in mercies. Grant us God's safe passage to and from. And continue God to work your purpose out in our lives and in the lives of your children. In Jesus' name, amen. The in the gowns are ready, so as soon as we reach by the sea, we're going into the waters. One song, choristers, by the beach, and we're going into the waters. Amen? Very good. Sister Shaman, you want to escort them to the to the van? Yes, please. Okay. Van. So Sister Greenaway? Sister Nomin? Sister Nomin? Sister Newman? <laughs> 